and setting free. That's the process in the kingdom. You've heard the story many times, I'm sure, or the adage, whatever it is, a saying. If you give a person a fish, they will have food for a day. But if you teach them how to fish, they will have food for a lifetime. So we're, we're going for teaching how to fish today. And, and what I want to go after is the whole idea of living a life with Jesus, not to where we're in bondage, get out, in bondage, get out, in bondage, get out, in bondage, get out. Okay. Can I suggest to you that's not the Lord's highest purpose? Thank God for people who come, have an anointing, and people get set free. I rejoice every single one of those things. But that's not the end of the story. So what we want to do is to learn to live in such a way that we live free all the days of our life. Doesn't mean every day's a good day. Doesn't mean every day uh, there's not trouble and trials. It just means that every day we live free in Jesus because of what he's done. Ephesians chapter 1 is where I want to start. If you'll turn there or pull that up on the screen. Ephesians 1. This is a familiar passage, obviously, in our church. 117, let's just start there. Because we sing this and quote it so often. That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you a spirit of wisdom and a revelation in the knowledge of Him. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened so that you will know what is the hope of His calling. And what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints? So there's an inheritance that comes to us from God through the Lord Jesus Christ that is rich and glorious. But we have to have eyes to see it so that we can take hold of it and believe it. Verse 19. And what is the surpassing greatness of his power? What is the next word? What is the surpassing greatness of his power? How much power does the Lord have? Is, is he pretty powerful? I, I was just pondering this passage and thinking about it in Psalm 8 how David says, Lord, you created the heavens, they're the work of your fingers. Like, it didn't take all that much effort to create the heavens, but it's 50 billion or however many billion light years across. There's so many stars in it. And our sun, you know, is only average size star. There's stars that are thousands of times bigger than our sun. He created them with his fingers. If you counted every star and you counted one a second, you guys know? Come on. How long would it take you to count it? You counted one star per second. 15 trillion years it would take you. That's the current estimate. That's a lot of stars God created with his fingers. How many believe that God has amazing power? But how many of you believe that his power is aimed in a certain direction? Which direction is his power aimed? Come on, say it. Toward us. His power is aimed. <laughs> what is the surpassing greatness of his power toward us who believe toward us who believe the surpassing greatness the exceeding greatness of his power is aimed at us it should do something should it not it's amazing power this is why we have to pray that the Holy Spirit shows us and opens our heart so that we can believe this Toward us who believe. I want to look at the, in this verse. There's four words that Paul uses for power. And I want to just slow down and just look at them for just a little bit. Because Paul is struggling here to express how great the power of the Father that is directed towards you is. He's not just saying power. So he uses the four Greek words, all of them, for power. All in the same verse. 
And let me just give you different nuances of meaning so that you can hold on to this. Maybe it helps us to get our eyes open. What is the surpassing greatness of His power? That's the first one. These are in accordance with the working. That's the second one. Of the strength. That's the third one. Of His might. That's the fourth one. Paul is struggling to express how great this power is, so he stacks one synonym, one word for power on top of the other, and he's got this sandwich with four words for power, all in one verse, and it's all aimed at his people. First word, power. How many know what the usual word for power is? Come on. Dunamis. You've been around here as much as long. Dunamis. What was the Greek word for power? Dunamis. Dunamis. So what do we get? What English word do we get from that word dunamis? Dynamite. Dynamite. And so we say it's explosive power. The idea behind dunamis is the idea of ability. So just how much ability does God have? All of them all. You guys are so weak. Come on. How much ability does God have? All. He makes the universe with his fingers. And when he brought redemption in Isaiah 53, I love this. If he wanted to flex his muscle, he says, To whom has the arm of the Lord, the Lord Jesus Christ in his redemptive work in Isaiah 53. It's called the arm of the Lord. When he flexes, let me tell you, things fly. And when Jesus rose from the dead, all kinds of things in the whole universe flew all over the place. He rearranged everything in the universe. God's ability to get things done. Second word is working. Anybody know what this is? Well, we're going to start giving more money for each one. Of you. Get a little bit more <laughs> working is what? It is the Greek word energia, from which English word we get. Come on, it's not hard. Energy. This means working. It's a working power. It's moving. He's always moving. Jesus says in John chapter 5 verse 17, My Father is working up to this very moment, and I myself am working. We're always working, bringing the kingdom with power. There's that kind of working energy and power. All of this is aimed at you. Third word in this passage, in this verse 19, is the strength of his might. The word strength means inherent power or strength as an endowment. So the opposite of it is weak and sickly. So if you get the opposite of that, it's power that resides within. What kind of power do you think resides within the Father? Is He stable or unstable? Stable. The strength of His might. And the word might is, I don't care if you like the Greek words or not, they're cool. <laughs> It's kratos, and it means dominion, ruling power. So his dynamic ability to get things done, his constant energy of working, his inherent strength, stability, and power, and his dominion and his ruling power. It's all aimed in a certain direction. It's aimed in a certain direction. Well, I just don't want to, I just don't want to pray because... When I pray, nothing happens. I think the Lord says, Really? What is aimed at you? What is aimed at us? The Father intends to impact us and to flow through us, I would suggest to you. He's not just playing games like, I'm going to aim, I'm going to shoot you. He's saying it's available to the believers to take hold of the power that is aimed at you. It's available to take hold of that power. So what Paul's dealing with here in Ephesians chapter 1, this is such a profound passage. Like if I had, I was thinking, I think sometimes like, if I only had one chapter of the Bible that I could keep, like which one would it be? I think it would be Ephesians 1. So the power issue, may I suggest to you, let's look at verse 20. First, I want to ask you, when did this happen? When did he exert his power? Verse 20, which he brought about in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places. So has that already been done? Has the Father already made that power and aimed it at us or is it something in the future? It happened in the resurrection. And when he exerted that power and raised Christ from the dead, he joined us with him. He broke the power of sin. He seated us with him in heavenly places. Do you agree with that?
with all of that? Okay. Do you agree with all of that? Yes. Okay. It happened at the resurrection. So the issue from God's perspective of power to live free, let's just apply it in this situation, that's already settled in the Father's mind. That's already settled. The issue of authority, verse 21, He raised Him far above all rule and authority. <coughs> and power and dominion. And every name that's named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. And he put all things in subjection under his feet and gave him as head over all things to who? Church. So weak. <laughs> gave him as head over all things to who? Church. The church. Right, does that include you? How many are in the church? Yes. So do you agree that the Lord Jesus has the ruling sovereign head over every single spiritual entity in the universe? The Father gave him as a gift to you. Yeah. yeah. That's crazy. But it's true. The issue of power and the issue of authority in the Father's mind has already been settled. It's already been bequeathed to us as our glorious inheritance. And here's the question. What are we doing with it? What are we doing with it? Can I read you something? This was um, stunning and surprising to me. And it just spurred me on in my heart. This is... um. A quote from Neil Anderson. And let me just give you his bio a little bit so you can understand that we're not dealing with somebody who's just a flunky. Neil Anderson got five earned college degrees. He was the head of the practical theology department at Talbot Theological Seminary. Years of pastoral experience. Anybody know how many books he's written? Just guess. 111 books he's written. His ministry is all about helping Christian believers come into their identity and to walk in freedom. Listen to this carefully because this is what this guy has given his life to for the last 30 or 40 years. Okay, So he's got a ton of experience. And I wish that what he wrote here was not true. But I think that it is. It is my observation that no more than 15% of the evangelical Christian community is completely free of Satan's bondage. These are the people who are consistently living a spirit-filled life and bearing fruit. The other 85% are struggling along fruitlessly at one of at least three levels of spiritual conflict. First, a believer may lead a fairly normal Christian life on the outside while wrestling with a steady barrage of sinful thoughts on the inside. Lust, envy, greed, hatred, apathy, etc. This person has virtually no devotional life. Prayer is a frustrating experience for him, and he usually struggles with interpersonal relationships. Most Christians in this condition have no idea that they are in the middle of a spiritual conflict. They would not identify with the concept of hearing voices, but would readily admit to a, admit to a problem-filled thought life. Instead of recognizing that their minds are being peppered by the fiery darts of the enemy, they think the problem is their own fault. If those foul thoughts are mine, what kind of person am I, they wonder. So they end up condemning themselves while the enemy continues his attack unchecked. I see about 65% of all Christians living at this level of spiritual conflict. Why do you want to talk about getting free, brother? If he's, if he's even close, if he's even half. The second level of conflict is characterized by those who can distinguish between their own thoughts and strange evil voices, which seem to overpower them. What am I thinking, they wonder with alarm, when a barrage of sinful ideas, thoughts, and fantasies flood their minds. They experience no victory and wonder if they're cracking up. But they're so frightened by the prospect that they won't share it with anyone. Yet the majority of Christians at this stage still fail to see their struggle as a spiritual conflict. They seek counseling and try to discipline their thoughts, but they experience little or no improvement. I estimate that about 15% of all Christians fall into this category. Most of these people are depressed, anxious, paranoid, bitter, or angry, and they may have fallen victim to drinking, drugs, eating disorders, etc. 
At the third level of conflict, the individual has lost control and hears voices inside his mind which tell him what to think, say, and do. These people stay at home, wander the streets, talking to imaginary people, or occupy beds in mental institutions or rehab units. Sadly, about 5% of the Christian community falls victim to this level of deception and control. That's, um, that's sobering. The enemy's goal for every believer how many think the enemy knows Ephesians 1? By yeah. heart. How many think he's terrified of an army of people that know that? So his goal, of course, if he wants his kingdom to advance in this world, is to neutralize believers by either distracting them, getting them into sinful behaviors that neutralize their spiritual effectiveness, somehow keeping them in bondage where their minds are constantly, they're constantly focused on themselves. That's the enemy's goal for every believer. Just focus on yourself. You have so many problems, you don't have anything to give to somebody else. Because he knows this is real and this is true. And if the church at large ever gets a hold of this, he's in big trouble. And he knows it. It's not us he's fighting. It's the one who rose with all power, who bequeathed it to us that he's in trouble with. He's terrified for us to find out this and to live like this is true. But if he gets us bound and deceived, he doesn't have to worry about it. He only has the few to deal with. How many want there to be an army rise up where we all stand free before the Lord? So here's, here's, here's the deal. In my view, freedom in the Christian life is, is not so much a single power encounter where you're released, although I rejoice in that and believe in that. But that's not the end of the story. Thank God for power encounters where demons are cast out and there's freedom. But just remember, Jesus said, when an evil spirit goes out of a person, he wanders through arid places, seeking rest and finding none. He says, I'll go back to the house from which I came. And when he goes back, he brings seven more spirits, more wicked than himself. And the last state of that house is worse than the first. So we have work to do between the power encounter and living in freedom. And, and here's what I want to, to say to you. Jesus, we know John chapter 8 and verse 36 says, He whom the Son sets free is what? Free. 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 Here's the question. How does he do it? How does he set people free? And the answer is just a few verses before in chapter 8. He says in verse 31, If you continue in my word, then you truly are my disciples. And you shall know the truth. truth and the truth. The truth will set you free. So what is it that actually makes us free and has, causes us to live free? Truth. It's truth. So wherever there's areas, this is what I want to encourage us with today. Wherever there's areas in our life that are broken or dysfunctional, it may be your marriage, it may be your personal life, it may be sinful habits. You know what you need to get free. Jesus told you there. You need an injection. The big need. Inject truth into that situation. The enemy is a liar. And the way that he keeps people in bondage is through deception. The book of Revelation chapter 12 and verse 9 says that Satan is the one who deceives the whole world. He's a deceiver. His power is in deception. Believing lies leads to thought patterns. Habits and behaviors which choke spiritual growth. If Satan can deceive you into believing a lie, he can control your life in that area. If Satan can deceive you into believing a lie, he can control your life in that area. Do you believe that? That's how he gets us in bondage. It's through deception. So wherever there's dysfunction, that this is such a like with counseling, to me, this is just automatic default. Okay, you've got dysfunction in your marriage, so tell me what lies you're believing. Tell me, just as old as that? 
What are you talking about? Yeah, what lies are you believing? So let's get down to the root of where the enemy has gotten a foothold in here because the Lord Jesus, in Ephesians chapter 1 and other places, has said that power is aimed right at you and it's meant to permeate. Do you believe that? It's meant to permeate every part of our lives, every relationship in our lives. It's meant to permeate. But if we believe a lie and we're deceived, the enemy comes in. Lester Summerall tells a story of a missionary was in Japan. And Lester was over there preaching. He was a traveling evangelist. And everywhere he went, every church, they were like, have you gone to see Brother so so He said, no, what's, I haven't. What's, what's up with it? Oh, he's in a terrible way. He'd been a missionary in Japan for years. <laughs> he said, well, I guess maybe I'll make my way that way when I get around in that area. So he finally went over to this man's house. And he heard the story. This man was in his house. He wouldn't talk to anybody. He kept his head down, wouldn't look at anybody. He had stayed in his house for months and months. He had grown a long, long beard like Santa Claus. And he had all those shutters in the house, everything closed up so that nobody could see him. And what had happened is this man had sinned. And he'd open up the door for the enemy. You see, there, there's, there's an issue so often when the enemy comes in and there's bondage there that we have given him a place. Ephesians 4, 26 and 27. Don't let the sun go down on your what? On your anger and give no place to the devil. Don't sin and give place to the devil. So there is very often, not every time, but very often there has a place that has been made for the enemy by our disobedience. And he comes in and he gets a foothold and a stronghold. So this man has sinned. And the devil had given him a spirit of fear. And the devil had told him, if you ever shake your beard, you're going to cut your throat and you're going to bleed to death. So he would never shake. He had a big, long beard. And the other thing that the devil told him was that the police are out there hunting for you and they're looking everywhere. So if you go outside, they're going to arrest you and take you away. And so Lester, everybody needs a friend like Lester. <laughs> Where he comes in and says, what's wrong with you? So he says to his wife, bring me a pair of scissors. He said, and bring me a razor and some soap. And so she did. And he went over there and he grabbed that man by the head and turned his head, grabbed the hook of his beard and cut it off like that. And then he grabbed the other side of his head and he cut off that part of the beard. And he screamed. Ah! He said, now I'm going to shave you. He put shaving cream all over his face with that stubble that was left after he cut off with the scissors. And he began to shave him with that straight razor. And that man was screaming and yelling so loud. Lester said, I just finally took the brush with the soap and stuck it in his mouth. <laughs> and where he was blowing bubbles. He said, now listen. The devil's a liar. He told you if you were shaved, you'd bleed to death. Now look at yourself in the mirror. You're shaved and you're not dead. The devil's a liar. He said, now get up. Come with me. He said, he grabbed him. Took him out to the door with a little bit of screaming and crying. He said, no, open the door. He said, now go out there. Find them. Where are they? You show me where the police are that are hunting you down. And he ran around, looked around every corner, whatever. He said, that devil's a liar. He's not there. He's lied to you. He said, now listen. We're going to march through town, you and me. He said, and if you don't go, I'm going to kick your feet. But you're going to march with me. He said, now get there. So he'd kick his feet every time, left, right, left, right. And he's marching him through town. And these little Japanese boys are marching behind. Left, right, left, right. And had a parade going through town there. This man marched through town. And he broke the power of the deceiving. Oh. And had many more years of fruitful ministry. The devil had lied. He's a liar. But you know what? There's no one who knows they're deceived. When they're deceived, by definition, like deception means you don't know it. Right? So sometimes you need somebody to come in and say, hey, what lies are you believing? Come on, the devil's a liar. Don't be bound by deception. It's always at the point of what we believe is a lie that the devil holds us in bondage. It's true every time in relational issues. It's true with our children, right? Can, can I just put in a little plug here for our kids? Yeah. Christian parents. Teach your children from the youngest age how to fight the devil. Yeah. Yeah. 
Thank yes. you. Most of our kids had an issue where, you know, this would be normal, I think. Wake up and they're afraid at night. Monsters, but even whatever it is. And so we would say, hey, you know what we're going to do? We're going to pray for you. But daddy's not just going to pray for you and cast that thing off of you. You're going to pray. pray. And here's what we're going to do. You tell me scriptures. You find what scriptures in the Bible. We're going to inject truth into the situation because the devil's a liar. What scriptures in the Bible can we take? God's not giving us a spirit of fear. That's good. You don't have a spirit of fear from the Lord, do you? What else? Resist the devil and he'll what? If we, so I tell him, resist. Come on. Pray like you mean it. You say, devil, get out. He said, this is crazy teaching your kids. No, it's not. It may spare them from living in bondage the rest of their life. spirit of fear like that at night it is yes. teach them no Jesus said I resist you I submit myself to God so I say God my little my little children God I submit myself to you devil I resist you get out so say it again say it loud devil get out say it again come on say it again devil devil get out how many think it went away forever at that one point then when it happened the next night or three nights later, they would come to me. I'd say, did you take your scriptures and did you submit yourself to God and tell the devil to go and resist? No, I didn't. I'd go back and do that. So i go back in the room. They'd take their little scriptures. I'd hear their little voice. Father, I submit myself to you. And I resist the devil and he has to flee from me. Devil, get out. Be something like that. I'd be like <laughs> but daddy's not going to do it for you every time no, I'll help you get free and if you get in a funk I'll help you get back on the track but I want you to learn how to do that a couple of my girls had this issue with like spiritual confusion it's like just don't know what I think or what I, I know what it is here's what we're going to do we have the mind of Christ. God's not given us a spirit of fear, but a power and love and a clear sound mind. Here's what we're going to inject into that situation. Put truth on it. It's a lie. I resist you. Get out. I have a spirit of power and love and a sound mind. I hear this little voices. We're raising up warriors that are going to take hold of this. Yes, and when Lord. they see the devil coming to them, they're not going to run and hide and go, Oh, please, Daddy, kiss it. I'll help you if you need it. But I want you to stand. You're God's champion for this next generation. You're the one who's going to raise up. I tell my kids, praise God. You don't have to have all the twistedness and dysfunction and junk that I had to work years to try to get out of my mind and my soul from all the sinful junk. You're going to grow up straight and strong and not have to deal with all that. You just start where I left off. Come on. You say, oh, that's just radical. No, it's not radical. Paul says, we, this is how we live our Christian life. We have the weapons of righteousness in the right hand and in the left. Dude, this is Lord of the Rings stuff. If you have a mindset and learn whatever areas of your life are messed up, there's probably a lie there that you're believing somewhere. Or sometimes multiple lies. And you have to cast down those lies. Because that's the point where the deceiver takes hold of you and gets in bondage. Cast them out. There's not a power problem, I guarantee you. There's not an authority problem. You have already been authorized by the Son of God. And he's wondering, and I know he's praying at the right hand of the Father, like, what are they waiting for? What are they waiting for? Father, what are they waiting for? Thank you, Barry. Help your children to stay free. Don't expose them to junk that's going to cause them to go into bondage. When I was a kid, my parents that know the Lord and raised in a Christian home, we would go to my cousin's house and watch this chiller theater jump. 
I got a spirit of fear in my life that tormented me for years from watching that demonic trash. Right. When I came to the Lord, I had to fight free and learn how to keep that out. <coughs> Don't be deceived. 1 Corinthians 15, 33. Don't be deceived. Don't be deceived. Why does he say don't be deceived? Because a lot of people are deceived right here. Evil companionships corrupt good character. Do you know what we do with our kids? No, listen, we're, we're not helicopter parents. You know what a helicopter mom is? She's constantly hovering over her. It's not like that. That's not healthy. But in the spirit, you can hover and they don't see you. <laughs> we would tell our kids, don't lie. The Holy Spirit will tell us if you're lying. They would. They'd be like, oh, I did it. <laughs> Praise God. Now let's get clean and free. Hiding and deception is bondage. Teach them how to get free. You can find out from the Lord. He will give you wisdom and insight over your children. You don't have to hover over them in fear. It's not fear. Listen to me. Parents, if you're fearful about your kids, you're in the wrong lane. No. We're, listen. He gave you those children, and he gave you authority and power. He will give you wisdom. You could be the biggest knucklehead like me. And, and my prayer to the Lord is like, Lord, I don't know what I'm doing. What am I doing? Like, I don't know how to do this. I don't know how to do this. He said, just shut up and listen. He'll show you. that the Lord alerts you to your children, there's something going on. We did this with our kids. Sometimes they'd be hanging out with other kids. Might be church kids. But like we saw, this is not good. Their spiritual life is not doing well. And so we'd ask them, do you feel like these relationships are helping your relationship with Jesus or hurting you? They'd be like, hurting you. So what do we need to do? Come on. Cut it off. It's awkward when the other people's parents call you up and go, hey, what's going on? Like, my kid said that your kids aren't going to hang out with them anymore. I'm like, dude. <laughs> I have to keep watch over my children's <coughs> spiritual life. I'm not blaming your kids. All I'm saying is, they're, they're, they haven't been, you know, they, I can see that there's definitely something going on there, and we're, we're going to find out what, what it is and get to the root of it. That's awkward. <laughs> it's really awkward. But my kids are worth it. My kids are worth it. My kids will tell you in those instances. It wasn't me coming in with a strong hand and going, You can't hang out with that jerk. It's not like that. It's, do you think that that relationship is enhancing your relationship with Jesus? You can teach them when they're young to view things in their life, whether they're good or bad, whether it enhances their relationship with Jesus. Then their life isn't full of junk where they need to come down to every deliverance thing to get all this junk cast off them. What if they live free and they never needed anything cast off them? Because they had in their hand the ability to cast out the lie and the deception before it took root. Am I talking good? I got it. Come on. <laughs> if you continue in my word, listen, we have to receive a love of them. This is, this is a powerful verse in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 10. It says that those who were lost were lost because they did not, listen to the phrase here, they did not receive a love for the truth. So as to be saved. And so they believed a lie. And were damned. Do, do you hear the phrase. Receive a love for the truth. We don't need to just be okay. Or good with the truth. We need to love it. I love you. Come. I love the truth. I want the truth. Lord, I want the truth. I want to believe the truth. It's one of my prayers that I pray constantly. Lord, I just want to believe the truth. Show me the truth. Open up my eyes and my heart to believe the truth. I don't want to believe a lie. He will answer that prayer. All right. Genesis chapter 3. I want to, I want to just go over this. Um, I call this section 3 encounters with the devil. Just to show us how he operates. You're familiar with these passages. But let's just look at them. 
I'm talking about getting free from bondage and living free and being able to set other people free. Because my experience is those who struggle, no, listen, nobody's throwing guards at anybody. We've all had our struggles. And part of the beauty of community is you can ask somebody, I've done it before, put your hand on my head and say, come out! Get off of my life. I think that's crazy. I, I do. If I'm struggling with some kind of something or other, very often it's some kind of flashback deal from the twisted life that I had before Christ apprehended me. Get that out. Come on. How many want to fight? How many know you're in a warfare? Come on. Weapons of righteousness in both hands. Right. Now you don't just have a little neat. No, you're fighting! Smith Wigglesworth said, I don't ever take a vacation because the devil doesn't ever take a vacation. I'm always in a fight for the advancement of the kingdom of God and in the purposes of God. Genesis chapter 3. Three encounters with the devil. Verse 1. Now the serpent was more crafty than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. Word crafty there means he's deceptive. He's a smooth talker. He's manipulative. He's seducing. And he said to the woman, Indeed, has God really said? Do you really mean you shall not eat of any tree of the garden? You, you see what he's starting out is? He's starting out with confusion. And he's trying to confuse her where? Mind. Mind. This is the battlefield for believers. It's in the mind of whether we're going to believe. The woman says to the serpent, From the fruit of the trees of the garden we may eat. But from the fruit of the tree which is in the middle of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat from it or touch it or you will die. If you look back up at chapter 2 and verse 16, it wasn't exactly the way he said it. She's starting to get a little bit confused. And the serpent said to the woman, You surely will not die. For God knows that in the day you eat from it, your eyes will be open. You'll be like God, knowing good and evil. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was desirable to make one wise, she took from it its fruit and ate. And she gave also to her husband with her. And he ate. And then verse 13. Then the Lord God said to the woman, What is this that you have done? And the woman said, The serpent did what? He deceived me. This was the beginning of the war. And from this deception came the misery upon all of the human race. It came from deception. It came from someone yielding to deception. And what lies, so, so help me here. What lies did, did the devil tell Eve? All right, I'm going I'm to tell you just the four that I gleaned from here. Number one, the first lie that he told her is that God's not good. His heart towards you is to keep you from fulfillment and joy and your highest potential. Because he knows that if you eat that fruit, you're going to be like him. And you're going to be able to enjoy all these things and your ability is going to be expanded. God's not good. He's trying to withhold from you something good. How many know that's not a sneaky lie? But how many have ever been in a situation in your life where that voice was whispering in your head? Come on. People that have suffered. Okay. You know what you need to do with that, right? Come on. Do I need to have my kids show you how to do it? <laughs> Say, no, I resist that thought. Listen to me. I'm telling you. I resist that thought. Get out! You're a liar. Once you identify the lie, tell it to go. Yeah, no, I am. Second thing the enemy lied to her about is that you won't ever have true fulfillment unless you go and take it for yourself. You take it for yourself. That's a lie. Number three, there won't really be any negative consequences for disobedience. How many know? We're all the fruit of that. That's a lie. Number four, your life is primarily about you, not about God. She looked at the tree and she made her decision based on it's good for food, it's going to taste good. 
It looks beautiful. I want to have that. And it makes me wise. I want to be that. Does this echo to you of something in 1 John chapter 2? All that's in the world, the lust of the flesh, it's good to eat. The lust of the eyes, oh, that looks good. I want that. And the boastful well, pride of life make you wise. This is where the spirit of the world entered into the garden and into all our lives from there. From that one little deception. Matthew chapter 16. There's the second encounter. I just want to show you how the enemy operates and what our response needs to be. Matthew chapter 16. Verse 16, we're going to start at such a powerful passage. And I love the way that the Lord orchestrated it so that it happened in this order. It's so helpful. Matthew 16, verse 16. Simon Peter answered, You're the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus said to him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, because flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. I also say to you that you're Peter. That means rock. And upon this rock I'll build my church and the gates of Hades will not overpower. I think he was feeling pretty good right then. I'll give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth shall have been bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth shall have been loosed in heaven. Then he warned the disciples that they should tell no one that he was the Christ. Verse 21. From that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised up on the third day. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, God forbid it, Lord, this shall never happen to you. But he, being Jesus, turned and said to who? Peter. Who did he say to? Peter. He said to Peter, get behind me, Satan. Oh, he should have done that. He probably hurt his feelings. No, he's teaching them something. You are a stumbling block to me. You know what that word stumbling block means? A stumbling stone. So here he was, Peter, the Petra, is going to be built upon this rock, and now you've turned into a stumbling stone two verses later. How, how many believe that the, the devil will speak through whoever will let him in? And how many believe that sometimes unwittingly, how many would raise your hand and admit sometimes you've spoken through the devil? devil spokesmen in the church were taken away. How good would life in the church be? Oh, Come on, you guys. Are. Come on! Oh. What happened here? How did Peter end up speaking for the devil when he just had this revelation from the Father that Jesus was the Son of God? Peter rejected a clear word from God. Jesus just said it. He began telling him over and over again, I'm going to die. He told him multiple times before this chapter. Peter rejected a clear word from God and substituted his own human wisdom and preconceived ideas instead, and Satan spoke through him. Do you see verse 23? Get behind me, Satan. You're a stumbling block to me, for you're not setting your what? Mind. Say it. Mind. Your mind on God's interest, but man's question. How do we set our mind on God's interest? Inject it. Inject it. You, you know what I've been in the habit of doing? Whenever I've got issues in my life or I'm like, I, I need, I need more. I'm dysfunctional, whatever. I'll take out note cards. I'll start thinking of every verse that pertains to my situation. And then I'll have them there. I'll let, I'll let them sit on my desk. A lot of times when I pray, I'll just lay on my back and I'll hold them up to the Lord. I'll say, Lord, look, like I know this and you know this, but here's where I'm putting down my stake in the anchor. I believe your truth is going to prevail in my heart and my life. And whatever's swirling, whatever's crooked, whatever's messed up in me in this area, I'm asking you to transform it by your truth because you said that if I continue in your truth, your truth will set me free, and I believe I'm going to be free. Wherever I need to repent, if there's more repentance needed, show me. If I've given place to the devil, show me. But I want to be free, and I want to live free. How many with me? Come on. How many times can I, can I just ask a question?
question, can I just encourage you? Like, in your areas of your life of dysfunction, rather than just coming down to an altar call, which I bless and I think is awesome, you understand where I'm coming from. I'm not demeaning that. I'm saying that's not the end of the game. What if I could teach you how to fish? If you could take the scripture and say, Lord, show me everybody. If you can't figure out any verses that apply to your situation, come and ask somebody. We'll help you. For real. Take that and use it like a weapon. Apply it to your situation. And pray it. And watch and see if the Lord will straighten you out. Guys, you don't know how twisted I was when Jesus apprehended me. I looked like one of those straws that went like this. But you know what? He wasn't intimidated. He said, I've got just the fix for that. He said, I'm going to put down inside of you a love for my word. And if you'll take that and prayerfully apply it to that, watch what I'll do. He begins unwinding the thing. It's amazing. we do the same thing for you. All those areas of crookedness, foolishness, idiocy. Now there's still some left. <laughs> Don't get me wrong. But you should have seen me before. The truth is powerful. The truth sets us free. We just have to apply it. Come on. Let's get aggressive with the truth of God in our life. Because listen, when you encounter somebody else that's bound, you can cast the devil out of them. And I've cast out many devils and they'll come out. Because they know this. They know. They know they're subject to Jesus. They know that. They, they have no doubt about it. But you're going to have to help them to fill back that house something that's going to be like a fortress that that devil can't do. And you might have to help them again and again until they get the knack of it, just like I did with my kids. Well, I'm going to pray for you again, honey, but did you take those scriptures we talk about, and did you tell the devil to get out? You know what? They don't ask me anymore. If they know how to deal with it in their mind, in issues. They'll go out and pray. I don't know if they do like I do, but Because the devil hates me and wants to destroy my soul and everything that has to do with me. Why would I play nice with him? He's going to go in the lake of fire and I'm going to cheer when he gets thrown in. And so are all the saints in heaven. Come on. I feel sorry for the devil. He wants to destroy your soul and everything about you. So, let's see the Matthew chapter 4. We're going to close here just a minute. This is Jesus. We looked at two encounters with the devil where there was a fail. Now I want to look at the encounter with the devil where it was total victory. Jesus mopped the floor with him. I want to tell you something. You can do it too. There's nothing that brings more delight to Jesus than you taking the authority that he's given you when the enemy comes and you mop the floor of him. I don't mean to be flippant. Sometimes people get over this thing where they're, they're flippant and they're foolish and they're, they're going to get hurt. But that one place for keeps. You don't go with some flippant attitude like you're going to get seven sons of seedling. You know that story. Like, that wasn't good. That devil jumped on that. I mean, I'm not saying to be disrespectful and all that. I had a friend who, a guy who worked for me for years, he was a biker, and he went to bike week in Daytona, he was telling me he came back and saw there was a big rattlesnake that had been running around by a car on the side of I-4. And uh, he went past and I said, man, that is a big snake, it's laying there on the side of the road. So he pulled his bike up, went back up to, to look at that snake, and he went over there and kicked it, and that thing still had life in it, bit him in the leg. He had to go to the hospital. By it, was, it was almost dead, but it had enough to bite him. I'm just saying. We're not, we're not talking about playing glibly with the things of the enemy. There's people that have foolish attitudes and they mock. Listen to me. Young people, can I tell you? I know sometimes it's fun. Let me just tell you something. 
when you mock and make fun of like well, the way other people and other ministers you know, do things, and come on, or you know, that kind of stuff, their idiosyncrasies, it grieves the Holy Spirit, and it, it, it diminishes your own authority. Don't do that. I'm just telling you something to help you. Don't, don't do that. Yeah, where well, that came from, maybe it was for somebody. Matthew chapter 4, verse 1. Jesus was led up by the Spirit of the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And after he fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he became hungry. And the tempter came and said to him, if you're the Son of God, see where he starts? If you're the Son of God, command that these stones become bread. He's playing off of his hunger. He knew he was hungry. The enemy is not stupid. He knows and he comes to the place where we're weak, or where we're vulnerable. He looks for vulnerabilities. See, right? He's not stupid. He looks for vulnerabilities in our life. And so he's going to come and attack there. So this is what we need to be ready with. We need to be ready with ammunition in the areas that we know we're weak. You go, in my personality, I'm just weak in this area. I tend to fall in this area. Then you need more armor in that area. So you go to the truth armor right here and you build it up. I don't care if you think you look stupid. Carry cards, have it on your phone, do something. You go pull it out and read it. If you have to read it to the devil, read it to him. He can understand it. <laughs> He was hungry. If you're the son of God, command these stones to be made bread. But he answered and said, I, I, I really want you to hear this. And I know you guys have heard it before, but I want to emphasize it. Every single answer. Do you, do you know Jesus never argued with the devil? He never reasoned with him. He never tried to analyze his thought process. Jesus knew this is how you deal with the devil. It is written. The sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. So when Jesus dealt with the devil, this is how we need to deal with the devil. Here is what he did. He took the sword of the spirit, which is the truth and the word of God, and he plunged it into his belly. That's all he did. Come on, try that. No, it's written. I'm not going to sit here and reason with you. I'm going to kill. And I'm going to kill the lie that you're putting out there right now. I'm killing it. Come on. You can't play with evil and think that you're going to win. You have to take... This is what Paul said. The weapons of our warfare. Though we walk in the flesh, we don't war after the flesh, right? For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but they're what? Mighty. They're mighty through God to the what? Pulling down of strongholds. We take into subjection every speculation, every reasoning. What's the, where's the warfare at? Where's the warfare? It's in your mind because he's trying to bring deception so he can get a foothold to come into your life. And you take the sword, which is the truth, and plunge it into his belly. Come on. Plunge it into his belly. This is how you deal with the devil. You plunge the truth into his belly. This is what Jesus did every time. It's written. Man should not live on bread alone, but every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city and had him stand on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, If... You're the son of God. Throw yourself down for it is written. See, the, the, devil, the devil can quote scripture. But here's what he never does. He never quotes it accurately. He never quotes it truthfully. Here's where you have to know the word. Because the devil will only quote a part to you. He quotes some of this on Psalm 91. He'll give his angels charge concerning you. On their hands they'll bear you up so that you'll not strike your foot against the stone. Jesus said to him, on the other hand, you know what I just gave you? Get ready for what I'm doing. It's ready. You shall not put the Lord your God to the test. The devil will never tell you the whole counsel of God. He'll only tell you the part that he wants to twist you with. This is why we have to know the full counsel. So that when the devil, you know the devil can quote scripture, right? But he always quotes it in a way that's going to lead us to deception. And we have to know the full counsel and go, you liar. Watch. Come on. How many think that's too Bible? I'm talking about the devil. I'm talking about people. <laughs> Take the sword of the spirit and cut him down with it. It's written, You shall not put the Lord your God to the test. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain, showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, All these things will I give you. If you fall down and worship me, and then Jesus said to him, Go, Satan. For it is 
It's written. Come on. I've got the sword that is the truth of God. I'm going to cut you down with it. You shall worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Then the devil left him. And behold, the angels came and began to minister to him. See, the devil does not like to play in that kind of arena. Where you have only one goal. Listen to me. This is how you deal with the devil. You take the word of truth. And you plunge it into his belly. I'm trying to leave a graphic for you. Okay. I know that's a little bit graphic. But I want to impress too many believers. We play the little mealy mouth thing with the devil. And you can't play that way with him. He wants to destroy you and your soul and your family and your kids and everything in your life. And take as many people to hell as he can. That's the definition of evil. Cut it down. Jesus gave you authority. He gave you the power. Cut him down. Cut him down. I want to read something to you in closing. I just, I don't ever, ever do this, but um, I'm going to read to you out of my journals. Um, I just felt like the Lord asked me to do it. This is a time when I was just out praying and the Holy Spirit just began to speak to me in kind of a in a very clear and powerful way. And it applies, I believe, to every person in this room. Here's what the Lord said to me. And this is one of those occasions where I just, I felt the emotions of God. And I wept as He spoke. And you, you know what I'm talking about in those kind of moments. Here's what the Lord said to me, I believe. The cry of the world and of the bound has come up before me and it does vex my soul. And so I have purpose to send deliverance and have raised up men and women with full consecration unto me to bring that deliverance. And I've worked and planned to bring it to pass. It's no wonder that Satan tries to misdirect and lead astray my deliverers by his subtle schemes. But if you will pray in the Spirit and seek my face in my word and consistently, I will lead you and show you the traps of the enemy and you will walk in the light and be light, and bring light, and glory, and deliverance unto the people. For their cry does ever come up before me, and it does vex my soul, and the bonds of Satan shall melt away. I want to say to us in here, encourage us. If you've still got issues you're struggling with, it's all good. This community will help you. Nobody's getting dark still in town. But let's set our sight on living free so that we can set free those others that are out there. It's not even those out there. It's so many in the body of Christ. So many. And their cry goes up before the Lord and it affects his soul. And where is the livers? He doesn't have any others. But his body, where is the livers? Let's take up the call. Let's live free. Let's get free and let's set free. That's our mission.